So we got about six questions. Um, I believe they were sort of uh, posted on Facebook, the six questions, and maybe some of you have the opportunity so we can further discuss this in the question and answer part is, should patients with ARDS receive low tidal volume ventilation and inspiratory pressures? Um, the question two is, should we prone patients with ARDS? Number three, uh, the role of high frequency ventilation. Number four, use higher versus lower PEEP. Number five, use of recruitment maneuvers. And number six is the use of ECMO. These are the six questions that we will go over in the next few slides. So historically, I wanted to mention here sort of the landmark articles um, that were published and in the first definition of ARDS introduced by uh, the authors, Dr. Ashbau, Dr. Petty, 1967, and the Vietnam era. This was the time where uh, post-traumatic ARDS was the most common cause of ARDS seen in, in severe trauma, and uh, patients developed uh, this sort of acute, acute hypoxemic distress. This is the first introduction of using PEEP at that time. And then we see several articles, and I mentioned here some things related to the use of steroids. The landmark article in 2000 was the ARMA study using low tidal volume ventilation. That was the largest randomized trial. And then we have other studies related to fluid and catheters, corticosteroids, and beta ARDS. Again, those will not be discussed today since we will concentrate on the use of um, the ventilatory part of ARDS. Then again, we have three studies that were sort of uh, published uh, two years apart, and now the analysis was done based on the combination of these studies, looking at the role of high versus low PEEP. So 2017 was the 50th birthday of ARDS, uh, and I'm quoting here Dr. Catanoni, who said that baby lung is an adult now. Uh, it's 50 years old, and uh, we have to understand and learn uh, more about ARDS and apply these principles better. Uh, so with this, this is uh, um, uh, taken from an article in the Intensive Care 2016, putting sort of the uh, time uh, uh, frame of landmark studies and discoveries and research. So on the top half of this graph, we see bench research uh, related to ARDS, such as understanding what the terms of barotrauma, volume trauma, and biotrauma. And we see the role of various mediators, systemic inflammation. More studies related to stem cell research are happening in the last uh, 10 years, but nothing applied clinically yet. Then we see here at the bottom, again, the 1966 was the first article related to the ARDS description. Uh, surfactant trials that were negative, the principle of baby lung of ARDS. Uh, and again, in the 2000, we see the, the ARMA study, which is right here. Uh, that was the largest positive trial in ARDS showing decreased mortality. We see the neuromuscular blockers in 2010, which we'll discuss later, and various studies related to prone position. So let's go to the question one. Should all patients with ARDS receive mechanical ventilation using low tidal volume and inspiratory pressures? And I think this is beyond doubt. Uh, now is well accepted international. Uh, this is the, so I like to always uh, share with you the trial. It took about 40 years, multi-center, uh, the randomization at that time using 10 to 12 mLs versus 4 to 6 mLs. And, and even though this may sound very injurious to us these days, but that was the traditional in this year. 1996, most people were ventilated with 10 to 12 cc's per kilo, and the trial compared this to the intervention, which is 4 to 6 mLs per kilo. The PEEP was very much similar between the two. Uh, we noticed this trial have shown significant drop of mortality, most with all significant p-value. Less mortality at 31 versus 40%, more days mechanical free mechanical ventilation, and also the organ fader part that I described in the case presentation was less seen in the patient with low tidal volume ventilation. So everything looked great with this trial. Everything looked better. So here I like to outline 
an issue that we see very often is if you look at the oxygenation of patients receiving the 6 mLs per kilo versus the 12 mLs. This is the 6 mLs, which is a lower graph. This is the PF ratio. So we notice patients getting low tidal volume ventilation in the first few days, maybe the first week, have lower oxygenation than patients that receive high tidal volume ventilation. So it may look to one of you, if you think that oxygenation is a parameter for treatment, that this is worse. Now we're learning that it is not, uh, should not be used as a parameter for ARDS as a target, because oxygenation uh, is not associated with better survival. You notice here after about a week, the PF ratio becomes similar. What is more important is to look at the next graph. So this is here equalizing. At the next graph, we see that we're starting to see diversion of mortality. This is a proportion of patients alive. So we see more people alive in the 6 ml than those in the 12 ml, meaning that it seems even though oxygenation was worse here, there's something happened and those patients now survive better if they didn't have the 12 ml per kilogram. We're learning today that improper ventilation, and I will show you the sort of an, a schematic of the lung parenchyma in patients with ARDS might explain to us why we see this diversion and more deaths in the 12 cc per kilo. So this is all related to ventilator-induced lung injury. So if you look at a patient here who's been recruited and you notice that the bottom part of the lung is a poorly aerated part, I mean, there's some area that you can't do anything about and it's completely consolidated, but there's a recruitable part of the lung. Now, in order to inflate that lung and open it up, you're going to end up hurting the normal lung. So this lungs at that high pressure that we used to use in the past would lead to hyperinflation here of the normal good lung that what we call it technically is a baby functioning lung, and the rest of the lung here sort of better, and this is, will not be touched. So this normal lung that has been injured by very high pressure is what lead to production of cytokines and complements and lead to ventilator-induced lung injury. So the patients are dying from injuring the good lung, not from under-recruitment. So overinflation and too much stress on the normal lung is leading to this uh, poor outcome with big tidal volume. So the other thing we're learning that spontaneous breathing in the early phase of ARDS is not good. Um, uh, earlier, in, this, um, in the ICU reach, I believe Dr. Uh, Perola presented about the use of esophageal monitoring. Uh, the benefit of that, and again, I won't have time to touch on it too much, is that when the patients have efforts and spontaneous breathing, they create more transneural pressures. And what injures the lung is not actually the difference between the plateau and the PEEP, it's actually between the plateau and the intrapleural pressure, which is hard for us to measure without extra devices. But I want you to imagine that these patients will cause more transmural pressures. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Brochard have named that entity called patient self-inflicted lung injury, or CILI. So the patient CILI is, is getting them, allowing the patient to breathe spontaneously uh, in the early phase of ARDS, increasing transmural pressure, causing more lung injury, and leading to worse outcomes. Based on this, we probably understand, and this is sort of a schematic of a patient who is either controlled ventilation here where we don't see any negative deflection versus a patient who's ventilated with spontaneous effort, and then we notice here that the, there's extra lung volume but leading to more um, transmural pressures. So with this, this might explain the benefit of the trial of using cis atracurium Compared to placebo, this trial used the same low tidal volume ventilation, same level of PEEP, but again, significant drop of mortality with 31% versus 40%. So again, this trial was very uh, uh, effective in lowering out, uh, mortality from ARDS, and we see here the number needed to treat is about 11. So very remarkable benefit of using cis atracurium. Uh, this trial wasn't very large. And I believe there's another large randomized control trial. Uh, this, at the present time, applies to that form of paralysis, so it doesn't apply to other drugs. And currently, this is one of the recommendations in the uh, ACS guidelines, is to use neuromuscular blockers. 
Again, in relation to both of these issues, spontaneous breathing, transmural pressures, uh, I would add the issue of driving pressure and survival in ARDS. And again, there's a lot of literature related to this in the last few years. This is a hot topic. Is, is the, the driving pressure is the difference between the plateau and the peak. Um, and there seem to be, when you compile all the data from the largest ARDS trials and looked at this driving pressures, they looked at the association between that number and mortality. Again, this is an association study. It's not a randomized controlled trial. So from this, the first article that was published by Amato is in Younger Journal of Medicine in 2015. So if we look at this patients and you look at airway pressure, and then we're going to see as the patient's more, uh, airway pressure rises, the PEEP is fixed, we see higher mortality in those patients. When we look at the patients here, so if you see the multivariate risk analysis, we see that higher delta or, or higher plateau pressure with a fixed PEEP leads to increased mortality. Now, the other scenario here, if we fix the plateau pressure, which we all learned in the past, and this is a very important you know, parameter to keep under 30 to protect the patient from ventilator-induced injury, and we look here at the use of PEEP, we see that uh, even though we fix the plateau pressure, that the lower the difference between plateau and PEEP is associated with lower mortality. So it doesn't seem to be that the plateau pressure here by itself is a determinative outcome, is another number. So if we fixed the plateau pressure, different, I mean, correction, if we fix the delta P, which is a, the um, driving pressure in those group of patients, and we have variable peaks and variable plateau pressures, we end up with the same mortality. So from all this analysis, we are, it seems that the driving pressure is what affect the mortality more than the plateau pressure, as we can see here, or more than the use of PEEP itself. So driving pressure seems to be the determinant. Whether guiding it for therapy is something that we have to see in the future, it is mentioned in the guidelines to be aware that that number, the magic number, is somewhere between 15 to 18. If you can keep it less than 15 or 18, it seems to be associated with lower mortality. From this uh, scenario, I like to point out that the right side of this curve is a sign for those of you who are going to use pressure control ventilation. This situation means that you have that PEEP is beneficial in this patient. If I were able to raise my PEEP and my delta P drops, this is what we call beneficial recruitment. Whereas if I were to raise the PEEP and the delta P remain the same, that means that PEEP is not beneficial to the patient. So you can take this from the study and predict when you have a patient on that mode of ventilation that higher PEEP in those patients, if it keeps the delta P the same or drops the delta P, it is beneficial PEEP and it's causing recruitment of good lung. Now, so this is sort of the association of we correlate delta P with mortality here. These are the three tertiles uh, for uh, the, uh, the tidal volume we notice here that the, the, the magic number seems to be around 18 from the New England Journal of Medicine. Some other data suggest 15. So somewhere keeping the delta P less than, um, 50, uh, less than 18 would give you the best outcome in ARDS. The question number two, uh, now should patient be prone? Now again, this is an issue related to the center experience. Now if we look at the evidence, these are the largest trials published. They're all randomized. Uh, these are, if you notice here, all the trials, the large randomized control trials are European. There's something about Europe, they seem to love the prone position, uh, and it is used definitely more often than it is in other parts of the world. Um, so if you notice these trials here, uh, of this, the largest positive trial is a PROCEVA study. Uh, and here we see dramatic difference between the prone position and the supine position with significant improvement in mortality with a significant p-value. It was published in 2013. And that, based on this study, the whole analysis and the, uh, and, and, the, and the look at prone position have changed. So 
Um, now, I wanted to show you here that if you look at the outcome, all the trials did not show benefit. If you notice here, uh, all the trials except this one. But this one contained the largest number of patients. So when it was compiled in the meta-analysis, it had the most effect on the whole meta-analysis. Um, so with this, I wanted to mention that these were centers, they were repeatedly studying it. And this is one of the editorials that these centers finally got really good at proning patients and did it for a really long time. So in the placebo trial, the prone position was done for 17 hours daily on the right type of patient, those who had severe ARDS and early in their disease progress. And it showed that these patients um, uh, did have better outcomes. So you notice 23% versus 41% is very, very dramatic reduction in mortality. Now, in the American Journal of Medicine, they have a link to a video that shows how they did the proning. Uh, these centers are very good at it. Their nursing team, their respiratory therapy team, the way how to manage patients, prevent complications. Um, so with this notation, I would say this is, with, this is a guideline recommendation. Prone positions for more than 12 hours per day in severe ARDS, and this is a moderate confidence in the effect estimate. So the caveat is your center experience. Uh, if you have a good team, nurses are well-trained to do proning, then it is recommended based on the guidelines. Uh, and one of the things I can tell you, we, we, we recently had a patient who was morbidly obese and had refractory ARDS, and whenever I mentioned the word proning, the nurses almost passed out. Um, so uh, this is not for every patient and not for every team. You can get sophisticated and use these special beds. Uh, I understand their prices are, are like almost in the $100,000 per bed. Most places would rent them because they're too expensive. So the third question is, should we use high-frequency oscillation? Uh, this is another uh, issue that has been debated, and then we hopefully have answered this. So normally when you have a patient with severe hypoxemia, these are the choices that we mentioned. So here we're talking about using high frequency uh, in those patients. Now, the trials that I wanted to share with you, the two largest recent trials, the OSCAR and the Oscillate trials, uh, that were sort of published in the same um, uh, journal, under the same issue of the journal, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, used ARDS, used high-frequency ventilation as an early mode of mechanical ventilation. So it was not used as a rescue treatment. We need to keep that in mind. The, the theory is that using this mode of ventilation would protect the lung, and let's do it early once the patient meets the criteria of moderate to severe. So if you notice here that the OSCAR trial uh, was negative and showed no benefit, on the other hand, the Oscillate trial showed that the patients in the control group did better than the high frequency, so high frequency was detrimental, and, uh, and both of these trials, in a sense, were negative. So based on these two, the recommendation from the ATS guideline is uh, uh, that routine use of high frequency in patients with moderate or severe ARDS with high confidence should not, it's, it's against the use of that mode of ventilation. So what this trial, both of these trials did not answer the questions is here, that the role of high frequency as a rescue therapy in patients with severe ARDS remained to be determined. So we haven't answered that question. And if you work in a center, you have the experience, you have the equipment to use high frequency, and you want to use it when your patient fails every, uh, you know, what we call conventional mode of ventilation, it is still possible to use it if you like to use it, and, uh, but again, as a rescue treatment. Um, so one of the sort of ways to put it together is if you have a patient with severe ARDS who remains hypoxemic after optimizing conventional lung productive ventilation, and when your approach uh, such as prone position and ECMO are either contraindicated, for example, when I mentioned morbidly obese patients, particularly those with a BMI exceeding 40, or ECMO is not available, then high-frequency ventilation uh, probably should be used based on your experience and, uh, and availability of equipment. So the question number four, uh, it's probably easier to answer, is what type of PEEP should be used in patients with ARDS? 
So again, uh, this is the meta-analysis of the four major trials. So I mentioned those to you, 1984, 86, um, and 88 were all three trials, alveoli, the LOVE trial, and the EXPRESS trial. They all compared low PEEP with high PEEP in patients with all forms of ARDS. So now we have data from the analysis of all these patients uh, and then we noticed that the patient who had ARDS, and I remind you at that time, the definition of ARDS was different. We had acute lung injury and then ARDS. So ARDS was a PF ratio less than 200, uh, whereas ALI was less uh, than more than 200. So again, this at the present time would fit the category of moderate to severe in the new Berlin definition. So if you did it in ARDS, it seems that there is a small but statistical difference, and patients with higher PEEP would do better. Whereas patients without ARDS, because that could be a misleading term, these are the patients who had acute lung injury, meaning mild ARDS, less than 100, had no benefit, probably worse, appears on the curve, but the p-value was not significant. But they didn't do better. It appears to do worse if you use higher PEEP. So based on this, the recommendation of the guidelines that moderate or severe ARDS with a PF ratio less than 200 um, should uh, both randomized or higher PEEP had a significant lower mortality. So it would be recommended to use higher PEEP than lower PEEP using the ARDS network uh, table. Now, how are we going to set PEEP on this type of patient? Uh, this patient is morbidly obese. Very difficult, and you know it's probably that's the only the best way for that patient to breathe is to be on their side to minimize the compression of the chest by the abdominal contents and the amount of fat. So, in this one, uh, I think there was a dedicated uh, session to discuss mechanical ventilation with esophageal manometry, uh, measuring uh, the pressures, and to properly be able to to translate this into understanding of transmural pressures. Uh, given that the lung is compressed by the fat and the abdominal pressure, this can give you different figures. Uh, so with significant abdominal pressure and uh, overweight, uh, in this trial, if we were to use esophageal pressures, you notice here, if you were to use conventional treatment, look at the level of PEEP. If you use esophageal manometry, you would use much higher pressure of PEEP. So the PEEP needed for those patients, once you know the transfusional pressure and you'll be able to measure the esophageal pressure, is you'll be a lot more comfortable and you would use higher levels of PEEP. Did that have an impact on outcome? It did. The trial was small. We see N of 30, N of 31. This is looking at clinical outcome, 28-day mortality, again, 39 versus 17 seems better outcome, but again, the p-value was not reached because the study was small. And we know now that it's a very large randomized controlled trial, hopefully it will be published next year, that will give us probably more information. But that was a single center, small trial, to suggest that esophageal pressure monitoring is helpful. It leads you to be more comfortable using higher level of PEEP appropriately, and it gives better outcome, better oxygenation. So this is the second trial that we expected to be published called the FVENT2. Uh, and this is randomized control using transformally pressure as a guidance for using PEEP uh, in patients uh, one with ARDS. Um, what about recruitment maneuver? This is question number five. Now, recruitment maneuvers uh, is the process where you inflate the lung, keep it inflated for a period of time. Um, the recommendations, again, in 2017, uh, mentioning, uh, it says here, the recommendation we suggest to use uh, recruitment maneuver in patients with ARDS with low to moderate confidence. And they do mention here that there were two trials that were pending publication. One is called the ART trial, the Alveolar Recruitment, and the second one is the Australian trial that used the FARLAP, uh, the abbreviation for the Permissive Hypercapnia Alveolar Recruitment. Now, these two trials use different forms of recruitment that I will share with you next. Uh, so the R trial is published after the guidelines were published. Um, and the R trial use op is, is by using this format. So this is the type of recruitment. If you do sustained, which a lot of us probably use at this day, is to maintain high pressure. So using like CPAP of 40 for 
for example, here for 45 seconds, this is how the art trial did their recruitment. Um, whereas the FAR lab, uh, the Australian study, did a gradual recruitment over a longer period of time. So you can see here that the, the pressure patient was ventilating with progressively increasing PEEP, then we had a plateau phase, then we have a gradually decreasing level of PEEP. Uh, and they called it the FAR lab because they love their horses. Uh, so the FAR lab trial is not published yet. The ART trial uh, was negative. Um, and so it was published in New England Journal of Medicine showing that patients who received lung recruitment and titrated PEEP, and this is looking at mortality, had higher mortality than the low PEEP, no recruitment category. So this trial showed that this form of recruitment was not beneficial and it appears to be detrimental, but again, the p-value was almost reaching statistical significance. Uh, so I think we have to look at this trial at the present time look, and, and in context that the guidelines were not aware of the results of the R trial. So, and the final question is, what about using exocorporeal membrane oxygenation? This is sort of the hot item, everybody's excited about it, and many large institutions are using this modality to support patients with refractory ARDS. Now, ECMO uses external lung. Uh, you have to take the blood out, as uh, a lot of you may be aware that this process requires significant intervention, full anticoagulation, a lot of indications, uh, restrictions on the indication, contraindication. But if you pick the right patients, this is a wonderful modality to protect the lung waiting for the patient's uh, underlying condition, ARDS, to recover. Uh, so far, the only randomized, largest, or most recent randomized trial was the CSER trial. And this CSER trial did their randomization sort of in an in unusual way that it required that if you have a patient who meets the criteria with a refractory, hypoxemia and ARDS, they should be transferred to a tertiary center to perform ECMO. Uh, so if you don't get randomized to ECMO, then you stay in your original hospital. And then what we noticed here that the patient that came to this referring hospital underwent ECMO had much better survival than the patient who were kept in their own hospital ventilated based on their uh, own program. Uh, so one of the things this trial tells us that it's not just the ECMO, it's moving the patient to a tertiary center with availability of ECMO seems to give them better chance of survival. And we don't know whether it's the ECMO part or is it just being transferred to a better hospital. Uh, if you notice here that those 68 out of the nine patients underwent ECMO and the rest did not. So these patients had better outcome and they were brought to the hospital thinking to put be placed on ECMO, but they were not placed because based on the assessment at that hospital. So we notice here the answer for this is that it is, we need additional evidence. Um, and, and so we have to consider this as an option to use. Uh, it's certainly being used quite uh, more in the, uh, at, in the specialized centers. And uh, now we'll probably await this uh, trial that would probably takes some time, but this is a trial that used PF ratio less than 200, multi-center, uh, it's called the EOLIA trial. And I think hopefully this will give us an answer uh, when, uh, uh, whether that modality of treatment is gonna save lives. So now, one issue that I would like to mention when it talks about ARDS and refractory hypoxemia is there are other things. 20% of patients with refractory hypoxemia have undiagnosed PFO. Uh, so this is one of the issues worth investigating, and echo in patients with refractory hypoxemia is really necessary. So you may discover PFO, and that might explain your severe hypoxemia. And the other one is 25% of these patients develop severe RV dysfunction. And those uh, who are really good at doing echo on the bedside uh, with good training in bedside echocardiography as intensivists uh, can you can monitor the patient's dysfunction, you can titrate their fluid balance, the way of ventilation, and observe the function of the right ventricle. So this is also an issue to keep in mind that may have more relevance to the outcome. Now, the last point I wanna mention is transfer to a unit with an expertise in caring for such patients where therapies such as ECMO are available. Now, this is something I would advocate, and based on the recent paper, this paper was published 
in 2018 in CCM I looked at the outcome of ARDS based on the hospital volume and ICU mortality in medical patients. So if you notice here, these are various hospitals, and this is the volume of ARDS patients treated in those hospitals. So this is low volume, medium volume, high volume. There's a good linear relationship that if you were admitted to those patients with high volume of ARDS and high volume ICU, you have the best outcome compared to those who have low volume. So expertise is very important and experience of the center with management of ARDS. So the low volume had the worst mortality. So uh, now, if we were to look at all these, this, this is the, these are sort of our six questions. And, and uh, you know, using low tolerance vinyl ventilation should be used in every patient prone position is recommended based on the guidelines. Uh, but I put this cautionary hand to remind you that, that only if you have the expertise particularly in your nursing, how to take care of those patients. Number three, high frequency should not be used. However, its role as a rescue treatment is uh, still debatable. Uh, higher versus lower PEEP seems to be recommended based on the meta-analysis of the largest trial. So this is something uh, advocated. Number five, recruitment maneuvers, although the guideline said to use. However, the, at least one of the two trials published showed no benefit or probably worse outcome. And finally, ECMO is an option, um, and um, it is something that we still look for. Now, when we look at this, and again, what is, you know, if I were to ask any of you, what is the most important factor in ensuring safe ventilatory support for the patients? Out of all these modalities, most of you would, you know, probably debate between these options. Uh, but I think the answer is actually much more simpler than this. The answer in what I believe is you, uh, is the person who's taking care of that patient. It's, it, the ventilator itself can be life-saving or can be a killer, and how you use that ventilator matters. So the person who is at the end and who's providing ventilation using the mode, watching the pressures, and using and optimizing all these settings is the person who is responsible about the safety of that patient. So no matter what you use, it's how you use it has a significant impact on the patient outcome. Uh, so I will stop here and hopefully we have time for uh, questions. Thank you.